Fantastic. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Grand Strategy Panel. My name is Shamster Johnny. I'll be hosting the panel and hopefully doing as little talking as possible. I'd like to welcome the, the game directors that we have at Paradox uh, on stage. Welcome, guys. So, guys, welcome. Uh, yeah. Just everyone, almost everyone, I assume, already knows you, but briefly, please introduce yourselves and tell us what ga games you're the game directors of. Sure, I can start. Uh, I'm Henrik Freyes. <coughs> oh, shit. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I have some back pain today. Um, I'm Henrik Freyes. I was a game director of Crusader Kings 2. Actually, I still am. Um, I worked with Paradox since 2001, been involved in most games we've done. I uh, was game director on Stellaris, handed it over to Martin. And now I'm working on an unannounced project. Cool. <laughs> Not saying. Uh, all right. I'm Martin Anward. I am the game director of Stellaris. I started a Paradox about five years ago as AI programmer. Uh, then I worked on EU4S Project Lead, back when Project Lead was more of a different kind of role where you're kind of everything at once. And eventually I took over Stellaris from Henrik, like you said, after the release of the game. I'm Dan Lin. I'm the game director for Swarm 4. I started like 10 years or 10 and a half now. I think that my first thing was like the first expansion for EU3. And then I worked on the, the first Rome game, so I'm super pumped about Imperator. And uh, I worked on like pretty much everything until then. I started getting into, I was doing programming initially, and then I started getting more and more into design and project leading stuff. And then I basically became game director on Hoi 4. Hello, everyone. I'm Jake Kleeper. And through a series of unfortunate events, I ended up in Sweden a little over three years ago. I'm currently the game director for Europa Universalis 4. Uh, and I'm Chris King. Um, I joined Paradox about 12 years ago. I was actually QA on Europa Universalis 3. Um, I was, I suppose, game director for Hearts Baron 3 and Victoria 2. And now I'm a game director for an unannounced project. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently there's two Victoria 3s in development. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This, despite two Victoria 3s in production, I still don't <laughs> think that would meet the demand for Victoria 3. Um, so, we, before this panel, we actually posted a thread on the forums and asked what kind of questions you guys had. I've collated some of those questions, and we're going to round off this panel with an open Q&A towards the end. Uh, the purpose of the panel is going to be to rehash some of the most popular questions that have been asked at least every year since I've been at Paradox for the last nine years. And somewhat also look a bit to the future, not specifically talking about uh, game series per se, but where we see grand strategy going as a whole uh, and um, what the future may hold on a broader sense. So one of the most common questions that has always popped up, it keeps popping up, and I understand it because besides our major uh, historical settings that we explore, we've also done smaller, more niche stuff like Sengoku in the past. So one of the most common questions that we have, like what are the other historical settings that you're interested in as, a, as individuals and as a team, and would you be open to exploring, and which ones are you absolutely closed off to that you think will be very unlikely to explore? Chris, would you like to start? All right, yeah, well, I'd say one of the settings I'd love to do and I still can't get a good hook for is actually the Dark Ages, you know, between, or not the Dark, well, the barbarian invasions, you know, between the fall of Rome to essentially start Crusader Kings. And, you know, I've always kind of been, that's kind of an idea that's turned around maybe the last, like, seven, eight years, and I can't get a good game for that. Mm. Uh, one thing I'd never want to do is the Cold War. Cold War. Because Cold War. Um, it would be, a, there's no war. It was a Cold War, you know. <laughs> Anyone else interested in the Cold War game? Well, I want to. I want to chime in on that one. And yeah. a bit of a trouble with working with the Cold War there is that you you have two mega powers, and then well, 
What else? No one else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But Britain's hanging in there. Yeah, somewhere. still, still there. But, uh, yeah. but no, you, you have two, two major players of interest there, and then outside of that, well, the world's gone a bit cold, so <coughs> yeah. what, what is there for you? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if I did a Cold War game, I would make the great powers non playable. You know, the US and the USSR would probably not be the playable ones. Uh, yeah. You would play one of the other ones, trying to curry favor <laughs> with either side. But and, uh, I was just about to say the same thing. <coughs> Yeah, I think that's the, that's the more paradox way of going with it, because I, I don't think we would make a game where there's only two playable countries. But if they're non-playable, you can have potentially lots of interesting stuff where you can carry for favor and stuff like that. Or maybe you don't even play a country. You could play a movement, you could play a yeah. political faction. I think that would be the actually really interesting thing about designing a Cold War game, is you would really have to rethink our formula. You couldn't just do Hearts of Iron, but now it's the Cold War, because then you end up with the end of the world. No, oh, everyone would play the South American Nazis, right? And try to take over. Okay. Yeah, or the Freemasons. <laughs> no, nothing wrong about a nuclear holocaust, though. But it's not what people expect from a historical Cold War game. Are you saying that didn't happen? I mean... <laughs> Cool. So um, I think that's one of the most common questions that we get all the time. We get questions about the Cold War, and it comes back to not that it's a, an uninteresting setting, but from a game and mechanics standpoint, it's perhaps not the most interesting. Yep. So the second most common question, and this relates back to every time Paradox goes through a major change, whenever uh, PDS releases a new game, people start having the conversation about depth versus complexity. Are we dumbing down the games? Arguably, our games are selling more than ever. Um, is it a result of us having dumbed down the games to the level of Candy Crush? Kind of a leading question, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> not, Candy Crush is a good game, but maybe it's not as deep as Hearts of Iron, so to say. Don, would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can start on this one. Uh, I think it's kind of a misconception. People think our games used to be more, more in-depth just because we hid so much of the stuff. It was very hard to understand it. Uh, I think Hearts of Iron 4 has a lot of areas that are much, much more complex and deeper than uh, previous Hearts of Iron, for example. Uh, there are parts where we might have simplified to, to move the, the player's attention to other parts, but I don't think it's necessarily true. I think it's just a question of like we hid so much stuff that it was really hard to get a grasp on it which meant that you thought it was more complex than it really was. I think there's this misplaced connection between uh, complexity and just being complicated, because yeah. so, so much in the past has been obfuscated, and uh, the fact that we've worked hard in, uh, in improving on that, you know, things become a lot more accessible, that doesn't mean it's just being dumbed down. I'd also yeah. say that one of the other things that's been kind of in making our games more popular has been quality. You know, as, um, the games actually work. So, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> And, and so it actually makes like, the features are actually a lot simpler because they actually do what they think, what you think, what, what, we, what we say they do. It's yeah. difficult to feel empowered with how smart you are when uh, you, your game will just work instead of you having to figure out exactly how to get it to run. So. Yes. Yeah, but Daria, yeah. like you're dumbing down the game if you don't know, have to know about the bugs and work around them, right? Yes, it's exactly. part of the experience. <laughs> really, no. Does anyone want to go back to Victoria 1 with buttons and buttons? Oh, that was amazing. Oh. That, was, that was the pinnacle of game development. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you see, uh, on a broader sense, do you see uh, our games in the future being broader in, in feature set or variation, or do you see your di yourselves digging down deeper into the mechanics? I think you need to start with very deep mechanics, and then through expansions you can broaden the games. Uh, I think that's a, a proper approach to it. Um, but I think with game directors such as us, you know, we make the games we want to make, and they're probably always going to be um, fairly deep and complex. Yeah, I mean, we always have the sort of simulation aspect. We try to build these deep systems, but a lot of the time what really matters is sort of the levers the player has to pull. It's the interactions they have, it's to see out of it. If you have the most complex simulation in all of history, but the player can't actually see anything what's going on, that it's just running in the background of the game, and all you see is perhaps a color changing, but actually it's six million lines of code determining which color should be displayed. That simulation has no real value to the player. It's more on how you can interact with it, how you can create good gameplay from that simulation. Yeah, I mean, simulation itself doesn't really give a lot of value to the players, unless you can poke it. There's a little bit of an aspect where you, like, say, uh, in Vicky 2, right, just watching the ant farm is quite cool as well. But I don't think it really lends itself to a lot of hours of gameplay. Oh, I don't know, you could ask the hardcore fans, see what they think. Yeah. <laughs> no, one of my favorite moments when I worked on Victoria 2 Hearts of Darkness was actually 
Do you remember when I came and told you I would fix the economy? Yes. <laughs> Every, many, many men have tried that yeah, and that's, fallen. He just laughed at me and then I came back the next day and said you were right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to pick up on what you said about, you know, we, we make the games that we ourselves want to play and uh, you, ultimately you'll never be able to please anyone, so no. you should please yourself. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, and then you hope, hope more, uh, peop, enough but people are like you, not, right? Not on stage. <laughs> <laughs> and you can turn around and see if I wouldn't buy this, who will? You know, that's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> So if we're talking about uh, not obfuscating the mechanics and the complexity is uh, largely there, the depth is there, but we're, not, we're doing a better job of exposing and let the players engage with them. Um, do you have sources of inspiration from competitors' games or other games you play that you feel that manage, like have a higher bar when it comes to still having depth and mechanics, uh, but doing them in a very accessible way that you're inspired by? Hmm. Henrik, <laughs> you can go first. <laughs> uh, well, there are, there are things that other people do really well. Um, single things that I, you know, we get inspired by. For example, in the Total War games, when you move an army, uh, the movement arrow shows if you will take attrition on the way. Uh, that's one of the things that I really like that they've added in. I think it was in the Total War Warhammer games. Um, so there are little things like that uh, that we pick up on. Okay. Yeah, I would also definitely say that it's sort of when you play competitors' games or other people's games, it's not typical that you will look at it and be like, ah, this entire system, I would take it and lift it into my game. But often it's the themes of the things they're doing, or it's the little things they're realizing, oh, you can actually build an interface that way. That's way yeah. better than what we're doing. So it's not so much the, we should steal your war system as... Uh, this was really neat, I like that you did this touch, I like the feel of this feature, I want to do something with my own spin on this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's more like that, right? You, you take inspiration rather than like, oh, that's a great idea to steal, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and I, I think the most of the stuff, as you said, is that we take knowledge from is honestly like interface work. Uh, it's never really been our strong suit in the older games. Yeah. I think that's where we've grown the most as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, on the top of it, playing, uh, playing the other games out there. I mean, obviously our games are the best ones out there. Why would you play anything else? But you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like anything. It's like a diet. You want to try a, a lot of different things. Otherwise, you'll, uh, you'll get yourself too trapped by your own conventions. So I've got to keep a broad range there. Yeah, I'd also just say it's quite interesting to see how other companies will solve a problem. You know, it's like if you take like you know one of the classic ones that go around in our games, rigid histor historicity versus kind of divergence, and then you kind of play historical games and see how each company solves it. And you know, various, some companies go far, far more historical with their games, and other ones go kind of, kind of go more free, free flow. You know, like to take Civilization as the ultimate kind of free flow kind of game where you start off as the Americans in 4000 BC. Yeah. Uh, Fact. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds to me like you, you, you guys obviously cut from the same cloth, right? And we all drink the same Kool-Aid. Uh, but what does the collaboration look like between you and from the different projects? Like you said, yes, you might be inspired by other games there externally, but like as we know, game development is a very iterative process. You create things, you have a vision, you try mechanics, it works, sometimes it doesn't. Obviously, it's very easy to look at stuff that's actually made it past release, just like everyone else here can do. But in live development, where you're training out mechanics, what's the communication like between you sharing learnings and new mechanics with each other? No, we don't. At all? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> quite true. But well, we no. have a, a weekly meeting where we talk about stuff we've done lately and so on, as game directors. And then the UX designers also meet up, uh, the interface people. Uh, and share their knowledge with each other and solutions and so on. So there is a, a fair bit of knowledge sharing, but we have more work to do on that as well. There's also quite a bit of uh, friction as well, and it's healthy for there to, to be so. We're all creative people. We will have, uh, we'll have differences in approach, but uh, it, it's good for us and for a company to actually work those things out and knuckle down on it. And that's part of our roles, right? We each have a fair amount of our own vision and our own autonomy, our own game, and we can go in different directions and sort of see what works out and what doesn't, essentially. 
if we were all trying to pull in the exact same direction, it wouldn't really make sense for us all to work on different games. Yeah. Yeah. Even so, though, I mean, there's stuff you can learn. I think uh, I slucked by you the other week just to ask about some stuff. Because quite often, you're going to do a system that's a little similar to someone who's already made it. And it's quite good to get insight from, from behind the scenes, like what they thought worked and what didn't work. Like, what did you envision it would do also that maybe didn't work, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so you have that kind of in your, when you start planning it for yourself. And a lot of that sort of knowledge sharing, and I think that's honor is kind of a general thing, happens in social context as well. It's when people relax and talk, because when you're in there during the day and you're sitting in front of your computer and you have a deadline, you're focused on your game, you're focused on your project, and it's kind of hard to just in the middle of that stop up and say, oh, right, I should go think about what things I could share with Torch of Iron 4, what you know, EU4 could do for me, because we're all in our own worlds. And of course, we can have meetings, we can try to formalize, but it's still going to be a lot of these sort of informal talks. So a yeah. lot of it is just that I think it's important that we talk to each other. It's also yeah. very important to go over to the other projects to gloat about the success of, of your own oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so do you have... Um, obviously, we have a lot of other uh, contact with other game companies in the industry. That, this kind of sharing of information, do you do this with counterparts in other parts of the industry? Are they, I mean, from one perspective, you can look at it and say that there's a lot of... Um, it, from the outward, it could look like there's a lot of rivalry between the bigger Grand Strategy Studios. But in fact, whenever you guys do a GDC talk, for instance, the auditorium is just filled with all the great designers at Firaxis or Creative Assembly and vice versa. Uh, there's a very collegial way of working together. Do you have any kind of more formalized way of talking to each other or do you end up just talking at shows? I mean, we do talk to other people. In fact, we, we had a bit of a meetup yesterday with uh, some guys from Creative Assembly and stuff like that. I mean, it sometimes happens around these things where we do a little uh, semi-organized thing, you know, grab a couple of beers and and talk about current problems, or if it's been after lectures, discuss them, basically. I wouldn't say there's competition on this level, right? Our games are too different, for the most part, to, to really be direct competitors. And I think even if they were, I'm not sure we would really, you know, I think many act differently. <coughs> yeah, <clears throat> I think most developers uh, in the strategy genres, except especially, feel like colleagues. It's a kind of a niche genre, and we all want to develop it and take it further, basically. Yeah, and there's I mean, also so many different directions. I mean, strategy games is an incredibly broad concept. There's room for hundreds, thousands of types of strategy games. You don't have to directly compete with someone to be the strategy game, because there will never be the strategy game. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> yeah, we also enjoy their games as well, so it, it works in our favor to have these little knowledge-sharing meetups that yeah. we have on, uh, on events like this. It's a missed opportunity not to do so. Yeah, I'd say if there's any rivalry, it's more of a friendly rivalry than an actual... Friend of it. Yeah. 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 And especially, I think, it comes from the fact that all, mo most of the major ones are doing quite well, mm. and everyone's growing together rather than growing at the cost of other studios and looking at each other for inspiration. Yeah, I'd also say that, you know, you don't, you know, you don't want to see other studios do badly, you know, you don't mm. really hope, you know, you don't want to see people lose their jobs and things yeah. like that. So, but le we've talked about uh, mm -hmm. you being inspired by others. Have you played others' games and s seen a system or a game mechanic and like, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> they took that from me. Wouldn't want to name names. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we see a little bit of that sometimes. Yeah. Or, you know, mm. we don't know maybe, mm. but we can s perhaps suspect. But I also think like, Creative endeavors are sort of inherently derivative because as, just as we talked about drawing inspiration, other people draw inspiration. And yes, it's a different thing to copy in something entirely, but I'm also not sure how much you can even do that no. unless you know copying the source code and just trying to do a bootleg game or something like that, or you copying a mod wholesaler. It's just, sure, you draw inspirations, but you're inevitably going to end up putting a different spin on it because you are making a different kind of game. Yeah, that's what creativity really is. You draw inspiration from other things uh, and make it your own. Yeah. So let's take it back to some of the, um, some of the influence back that we get from the, develop, uh, from the audience, largely the player base. And you know, we talk a lot about how important it is to listen 
closely to the community and understand what their needs are and adapt accordingly. But we also talk about listening in the right way, not necessarily giving people exactly what they're asking for, but understanding what their needs are and then you applying your... So how do you balance, I think my question is, how do you balance the need of the few versus the need of the many? In, well, mods, are, mods are a great way of doing that, for example. Mod support yeah. as much as we can. And also, like the game rule system we added to CK2, where you, as a player, can turn on and off various features and mechanics as you like uh, without changing the, uh, the checksum or anything, so you can still play with your friends uh, in multiplayer. Um, I think that's one way of doing it, and yeah. it's very effective. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd also say the community is very, very good at articulating what's wrong with the game, yeah. and not necessarily how to actually solve it. Because if <laughs> no. you ask for a solution, you usually get um, you know, more, more answers than there was actually people posting and things like this. So yeah, yeah you know, I mean, the community feedback is very useful when you're trying to think, okay, okay the, you know, you're looking, say, planning a DLC, and you're looking through the feedback, and they're going, oh, this system isn't working, and these kind mm. of things, you go, okay, this is the system we look into. Yeah. This is how we start developing and lifting it up. I mean, I rely quite a lot on telemetry, actually, just hard data and stuff to kind of verify what I'm hearing on forums and stuff as well. It, it can never really replace someone specifically telling you something. In those cases, I usually ask people to just tell me. Could, could, you, could you give us an example of where yeah, so, there's so been a, yeah. Lately, like, if I, if I listen to the forums, people are going, like, hard environments is too easy. So I started tracking, like, uh, telemetry on that, and it's like 1% is using the hard difficulty. And I mean, quite a lot of it's like 24% or something on the very easiest difficulty, which is a new one we even added after noticing that. And I was kind of wondering why. Uh, so I actually asked a lot of people, and this, of course, is a question that you don't necessarily want to write on why. It's like, why are you playing this game on super easy, right? <laughs> uh, the internet can be a harsh place for judgment, right? <laughs> so I asked people no actually send me PMs, which was totally a mistake, because I think I got like, so many PMs. Uh, but uh, that one really shone light on a lot of it uh, and kind of showed why people are doing it. And it's not always because they actually think it's hard. It's because they want to tailor their experience. They only have a certain amount of time to play that day or something. And easier usually means faster. And it also depends what goals you set up for yourself to actually accomplish. One thing I definitely think that uh, community feedback is really important for is those little issues that you become blind to as you're working on the game. You know, you have this interface, and it's kind of a bad interface, but you programmed it, and the QA have been sitting with it for months, and everyone knows how it works. They know, okay, you just have to look here, and you're there, and in that tooltip, and here, and of course you will know how many of this you're producing. And then someone comes who has never seen this, who doesn't know how it works, and it's like, I can't find this. And we're like, oh, yes, of course you can't find this, because you have not been sitting with this for months. You are not looking at this with fresh eyes. And this is the sort of thing where we can completely just not realize there's a problem and understand only because the community tells us. Yeah, yeah and that's why it's great to have a user research department so we can bring in people and study what they're doing. And uh, I think that's helped us a lot lately, at least. Definitely. Yeah. It can cool. also be kind of easy to feel like, oh, your, your feedback is, uh, is not being heard because it, the, uh, it takes quite a bit of time for there to be, actually be a reaction to the feedback. But rest assured that we know if there is a sentiment uh, about our game, we do know. Yes, yeah, so your feedback is important to us. Please hold. <laughs> yeah, it's much faster. To, it's much faster to read than to answer. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Uh, about the you know stuff like quality of life that you were mentioning, like a uh, thing we do quite a lot is actually just watch people play streams and go like, oh, why are they doing that? That feels like. It's a lot of work. I didn't think about that. I usually do it like this, you know. Yeah, I think that's the most frustrating moment when you have like put out the pre-release streams and things like that yeah. right before release, but too late to change anything, and you realize that every single person playing it is yeah. fumbling with the same interface, and you're just like. Yeah, I, I had a moment like after Hoy release when I when I was watching streams and I was like, no, you closed the alert already. That's why you can't find this thing. <laughs> so we so we made it pop up again. But. <laughs> but that's, a, that's also a great way to realize, you know, you, you, you saw it in your infinite wisdom. Obviously, it would work this way. And then when, uh, you know, nothing survives first contact. Oh, no. <laughs> so... It... No, that's one thing about players. They do tend to use your game in ways you never quite imagined, which can lead to all sorts of interesting kind of, <laughs> so we say, edge case problems and unbalance issues where... Hoi for racing game. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you have so many different ways to play that game. Uh, Chris plays it in a very specific way, so he always comes to me with, with weird bugs that nobody else has. Still got that QE touch. It goes like, I'm, I'm, I'm peaceful Germany in 1946, and this thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peace reigns. Yeah, so yeah. speaking of feedback, so um, since it's a, it's a good opportunity to actually provide feedback back to the community, what's the ideal form of you know, feedback about the game? Like some people, you know, we often talk about there's a, a, a minority often that is, have hard issues or some very specific topics that they care deeply about or think things are very deeply broken and they can be louder than others that are largely in the games and just playing the game and being, not posting on the forums. What is the most constructive way for, the, for the, the vocal minorities to make sure that their voices are heard, that they, you know, Every time we release something, people post about, like, why don't you have ultra-wide monitor support? And we can look at the hardware reports, and we see that 0.2% use ultra-wide monitors, and that's not a prioritized issue. So we have data in some ways. But in other cases, when players provide feedback, what's the ideal form of providing feedback to you guys? PM to Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Only when it's specifically asked. No, uh, for me, um, I like stuff to kind of simmer in the community, so I don't have to read everything, I can go like, well, this thread has a lot of discussion. There's probably something important going on in here. So I, I tend to go by that. So if it's on Reddit or something, I'll, I'll look at the most upvoted stuff, because then clearly it's the, mo you know, the bigger issues. Same on our forum, like the number of comments, that kind of stuff. If something keeps coming back as well. For me, I would say that sort of idle form of feedback is a clear identification of what you think the problem is and a idea of sort of what you would like it to do instead. And by that, I don't mean a six-page design document, which is sort of thing we sometimes get. And it's like, <laughs> I appreciate that you're passionate. I appreciate that you have this, and I'm sure there's good ideas in here. But we are also game designers. We are going to want to sort of implement our own solutions. So it's more like, I don't like the faction system because I don't think it offers enough interesting interactions with other empires. I would like the faction system to be more tied into other empires. That for me is a fantastic form of feedback because it identifies what is it about the feature you don't like, what is it that you like the feature to do, but without going into, I would like a button here that does this and does this and this one and this and please do this as well. Yeah, to bandwagon off of that one, it is great to know where your expectations have been dashed. Because I, the the least helpful thing I can hear is fix X. And I, oh, okay, all right, we'll we'll make it rickroll you every time that you engage with this feature. You know, we we've, yeah. we've fixed it. No, I want to know what what were you expecting out of this, and uh, and where where did it fall short? And that'll yeah. actually give us something something to work with. And again, we don't need. We don't need the six-pager on how, how to design it. We'll, we'll work on that one. But yeah. uh, the identification of the issue is key here. And, uh, and again, like Dan was saying, yeah. we'll, we'll be able to see what's really catching ground. If it simmers within the community, then we'll, yeah. we'll know what the sentiment is. Yeah, and yeah if, Anna, if, if it yeah. simmers in the community especially, you know, keep emotion out of it. <laughs> Just be clear and give clear feedback. Yeah, yeah. and uh, don't, as you said, don't, don't assume that we know all the details. Don't go fix this or X is broken, because we might not actually know what you mean by that. Right, you have to... No, I don't know how many times I've read it. that. Yeah. F fix uh, piety. Fix okay. the building. You know. <laughs> it, it sounds <laughs> like, and one of my favorite quotes that I come back to when we talk about in our uh, product development, uh, when we start up new projects, is that the classic Henry Ford quote, right? If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse and a faster buggy. Fix piety, fix religion, or whatever it is. Mm. Instead of understanding what people's need, needs were, they wanted to go from point A to point B in a fast and an efficient manner. Maybe there's a product, a car, that could do it, but they don't know that a car exists. Yeah. So if you guys understand what the problem is and what the needs are, you can then design other things. Ideally, since you are game designers, ultimately, and you can do that. Yeah, I'd also say that we're actually looking for future products to be able to explore telemetry data more. Yeah. You know, try and get more gameplay data in so we can see how people are playing and try and, try and to think in our head what potential issues could come up in the game and then set up telemetry data to let us know if these are happening yeah. so that we can then hopefully fix them. Don already mentioned that. Do you have any other points of uh, stories where telemetry actually kind of like was an eye opener or changed the design for you guys? Well, there was one for EU4 where we, um, after the Prussia patch, 
yeah. we decided just to look at the uh, countries you started playing after you got the game and would you stick around? Yeah. So for brand new players, uh, or no, not for new, for, for, for old fans, they would fire up like Prussia and Brandenburg and most of them stuck around. So we knew, you know, they liked what we were giving them. But we noticed for brand new players, that if they started with the Ottoman Empire, they, they just didn't stick around. No. 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 Because we'd, 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 we'd marketed this as an easy country for you to start with. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we'd made a bunch of changes to that country to make it um, you know, more in-depth. So new, oh, existing players were loving it, but it was a complete turn-off to new players. Sure. So we stopped recommending it to new players. Yeah. It's problem that, that, solved. That's the kind of information we would have never gotten otherwise. So we can take a step back and go, okay, what, what, what should we be recommending mm -hmm. to our players here? Cool. So uh, jumping off to a completely different subject, uh, this is a... Uh, question that popped up. Do you think that there's one, do you see there being one big misconception about your games or the game design process that you think that is some, sometimes lost in translation that you like to clarify? Who wants to start? I don't know. Do they have uh, conceptions? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have one that I spoke to uh, Chris with the other day, and it's, it's, it relates back to a question that we often get, and, and especially in this thread. Somebody posted, like, you've been using Clausewitz for 10 years now. It's, it's, it's getting old. Shouldn't you move on to the next engine? You're held back by the limitations in Clausewitz. And you and I talked about how people tend to maybe, from the outside, look at engines like it's a car platform. You're not buying a Volvo uh, 240 and then driving that for 10 years. Well, yeah. engines work in a different way. Do you feel that that's a, w one well, of those? Well, definitely the traditional means of game development was you designed an engine, you chunked out a bunch of games on it, then you built a new engine. But we're, we're uh, now, at least we are, trying to basically have a living engine. Yeah. And as people who have seen the Imperata screenshots can hopefully realize, you know, our map, we're trying yeah. to bring up our map tech, we're also looking at the event system and all these kind of things yeah. for future games so that we can do more. Yeah. yeah, there's usually a jump with every game a bit, right? But we don't really have a big version thing. That's mostly for companies who kind of license their engines and stuff like that. So, so for us, it's kind of class with, and then, you know, you can, at some point, you have a version for your game when it's time to release it. Mm. Yeah, the older projects will freeze their version of class with at some point, possibly bring in newer things, but generally, the engine will continue to be developed. And Clausewitz today is completely, yeah. or almost completely indistinguishable from Clausewitz for EU3. There's just, oh, yeah, it's such cool. a different engine. So it's not so much even that it's the same car and you keep tuning it up as it's a car. It's a completely different car from the last car. So when you're asking like, is it the time for a new engine? You're basically asking, is it the time to not have a car anymore? Yeah. yeah. Any other assumptions that you think that they're out there that you think would be good to shed a bit of light on? It's almost impossible to kill, but some people think we don't do multi-core. <laughs> yeah, so this is the thing that keeps coming up no matter how many times we sort of try and explain it, but no, Clausewitz is not single threaded. We do not have single threaded games, and it's not that if we switched 64 bit, everything would magically be <laughs> improved in every possible way. In fact, it would probably slow down, actually. Yeah, it would actually, yeah. We, it would actually slow down the games. Okay. So, what it is, is that we have this thing called a synced game state, which is when you play multiplayer, all the machines are running the game simultaneously. Mm. And you can't really do that with threading because you can't predict the order of execution properly. You can do it with some things like the AI where we use special systems to sort of post commands to the game and make sure everything happens at the same time. But you could not fully thread everything. And honestly, that's true even in a non synced game state is that just some things you can't thread because of the issues of thread execution order. Now, we have said this many times, and even after saying it today, that's a misconception that probably will never die. No. Yeah. Yeah, this question will come up again in 10 years. If you want to find out what it's like, uh, starts of iron, hearts of iron with the command start flag, threads equal one, and you'll see what the difference is. Because that turns off multi-threading for Hoi, and it's, it's, it's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? It's those? not very playable. <laughs> okay. Sadly, we have to use it sometimes for debugging, and it's a super painful <laughs> process. <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. Let's move on to another popular topic, which 
in part relates back to the overall business model. You and I, Hendrik, we did a talk at GDC this year that was about the business model of uh, our grand strategy games, our, our DLC model, which we love, of course, but does get a bit of uh, uh, friction at times. But I think it largely comes back to us maybe not explaining the values in it. And we are forced to deal with the conditioning that a lot of uh, players have from other companies in the industry rather than what we have to do. A lot of people look at a product page and see a bunch of DLCs and assume that if I don't get everything, I'm not getting a good or a proper game experience. But a, a bigger philosophical question is, what's, what's the perspective on quality of life improvements in, in, in the product versus expansions and what's the right way of balancing putting quality of life in the main updates, the free updates in the main game versus having them in some of the expansions. <laughs> Johan, Johan Anderson unabashedly said like, if we put them in the expansions, they sell more. Mm. <laughs> but maybe that's not the best way of going about it. But he's quite binary in that sense. What's your perspective on quality of life uh, improvements? I think it's a, it's a matter of... Uh modularity and the scope of them, basically. If they're small, um, they should probably not be a paid feature. But if it's an entirely separate widget that you can use for sort of macro management or something like that, I think it's, it's uh, reasonable to make it a paid feature. Um, I think there's a couple aspects that go into the choice. Uh, when, I, when I plan out expansions, I try to hit like a 50-50 thing. Uh, but then when you look at individual features, it often comes down to like, how will this be like maintaining it? Uh, because if I made this paid, then I technically I have to maintain two paths, for example, uh, or two ways of doing something potentially. And in that case, it might not be a good feature for that, so I'll, I'll look somewhere else. Uh, but I'll try to have an even split, so there's stuff that, f f that people get in the free updates and in the expansion as well, so it feels balanced. I mean, there's definitely sorry. Yeah. There's definitely sort of an ideal format for paid content, which is like, you know, here's extra content to the game that is completely separate from everything else. But you can't always only do that because you want to do other things as well. So it sort of comes down to precisely what you said is that, yeah, you definitely want to think about the scale of it. And you also definitely want to think about not sort of deciding yourself into a pit not deciding something that you're later going to want to work on, and then you can't assume that someone has that expansion and can work on that. We made that mistake a few times, but... It's also with our model. Now, I'm obviously going to take EU4 as the example here. If you'd bought that game over five years ago, we've done so many updates to it with so many free features and free additions to the game that you, you almost... It's, it's so different from when it came out that far ago. So even if you just made the investment long ago, uh, you are still getting new content, new, new nations to play, new map, uh, new features added in. So it's, uh, you know, even if you don't spend a penny on the expansions, we continue to work on the game and provide you. And I don't think yeah. people quite realize the limitation if we didn't have this model, because then we would essentially be, we can only do so many expansions. Because if you have a sort of traditional model that the older games worked with, like Victoria 2 and so on, then each expansion will require the previous expansion. And that's fine yeah. for a couple expansions or so, even though it also definitely means that you will have to pay for every little bit of bug fixing quality of life update after a certain point, because once we're done with the support patches, we will have to move on to the expansion. And if the expansion is also the patch, yeah, uh, but it also means that we, how could we possibly keep developing EU4 right now if every expansion required a preceding expansion? It would be this insane tower, and it would really be, hey, you want to come play this game? By the way, you absolutely have to have all yeah, of Yeah, there's the thing. So I was up announcing Dharma just the other day, and uh, thanks for the raucous applause, but I don't think I would have received that if I went up there and went to Dharma. Available if you also own Cradle of Civilization and Resima and... Uh, anyway, just keep going. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, it gets really weird when you're doing these kind of more focused area expansions as well, right? Yeah. I would also say from a design point of view, the DLC model is actually very liberating, because if you're trying to do a grand scope game, and um, you try and deliver everything in one go, you kind of just can't give everything the individual love. Mm. But what you can do right now with our new models, when you're designing a game, you can sit down there and go, okay, look, this here, it's not, it's, it's, it, it's a nice to have, you know, add flavor, immersion, but it's not really essential for the core games. So you can go, okay, 
I'm going to leave this to side so I can give more love to the kind of really core game, but, yeah. you know, to, and then later on I can then go back to this and give it the treatment it deserves. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a part of this, and I, and I ask this because I know it's an ongoing challenge, is that part of the issue resides not with the, the model itself, but rather how it's presented. A product mm. page on Steam is what a product page on mm. Steam looks like. Mm. And you're just, it's presented in a way where you just, you, you get this analysis paralysis. Mm. But one of the questions that has been raised is that, and I know that since we've done a bit of reorganization at Paradox and you're closer, much closer to the business stuff that you were in the past, although you were pretty close to it before as well. Do you see there being a point where we start folding in some of the expansions into the base games and start doing, you know, some of the older ones are just automatically included? It's certainly a possibility that we have. You know, if we have discussed it sometimes, and it's certainly possible that it will happen. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, I think even even just for uh, make it easier to buy the thing and know mm -hmm. what you what you're buying, because some of our stuff is getting fairly long lists, and if you're interested in a specific thing, I think we could do a better job bundling at least yeah. to make sure it's yeah. easier to. You know, which of the expansions have the biggest impact on Warfare and U4, for example, but, that kind of stuff. Yeah, because that is definitely something we hear. It's like people going, I tried to get my friend into CK2 or EU4, and then he took one look at the Steam page and ran away. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think there are definitely things to overcome. I think uh, during this kind of debate, we issued a challenge and said, like, you know, we challenge anyone to just get vanilla version of any of our games and they would get an amazing gameplay experience out of it, and it's playable completely without the expansions. And Strategy Gamer took us up on it and actually played the games in vanilla without any of the expansions. I think it was TJ who did it. Yeah, there he is. Yeah. And I think he ultimately ended up with the, the answer of like, yeah, it kind of works, but then again, it's TJ. <laughs> I think the, the more fair test would have had action, an actual civilian try it who doesn't have a, ba a bajillion hours of CK and then see how their experience would be like. But okay, so we're kind of wrapping on time and just one more topic that I'd like to cover because it's close to what I like and then we're going to open up to questions. I'm pretty sure a lot of people have questions. So multiplayer. All our games always have multiplayer. There's been debate about how prominent it is. Do we design four multiplayer versus single player? In percentage, depending on the title, the number of players who play multiplayer varies between you know, 7 to 15%, depending on title, time of the year, Christmas, whatnot. Uh, but we also know anecdotally that people, we know people who buy six copies of EU and then pay their friends to actually play multiplayer with them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is weird. Is that you, Jake? Oh, damn. <laughs> we're very grateful for Dean, to Dean Hall, who does this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the question to you is, that where do you see multiplayer going in a bigger perspective 10 years on? Not the titles you're working on currently, but a generation uh, removed. When we're sitting at PDXCon in 2028, what's the state of multiplayer? <sighs> Super high level. Well, I think definitely I feel that multiplayer is growing because we've improved our technology, you know, hot joining, uh, resyncing in Hoy is one there. So it's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's less of a chore than it used to be. You know, where you, if you desync, then you've got to all stop, rehost, get back on board and all these kind of things. So, you know, from our point of view, we want to make multiplayer less of a chore if we can so that, you know, more people can get in and enjoy it because it is, it is kind of like the you know, Hearts of Iron 4 2.0 to play in multiplayer, or EU4 2.0, you know, to play up against real people rather than yep. the AI, because we can only do so much with that. So our, our goal is hopefully that everyone will be playing multiplayer. Yeah. I think, I think long term, what we need to improve to get more people into multiplayer is, is matchmaking and lobbying. Uh, it's quite hard to organize a big, big game. Um, you kind of have to go to the forum and get your friends because it's a big time investment. I think Hoy is the one that's probably easiest because it's a little shorter scope to play a multiplayer session. Um, but even then, you're dedicating quite a lot of hours. So you kind of make sure that everybody kind of stick around for that. So I think what we need to improve long term for that is, is really matchmaking. Like, how do I find people who want to play the same way I do easily without having to like wait around on the forum or 
or organize some stuff like that. Yeah, I have very fond memories of just having a lobby simulator for hours on end in some uh, <coughs> early iterations. But yes, uh, you asked about the dream in uh, 2028, and that's when you can seamlessly slip in and enjoy a multiplayer game just like you could playing a single player game, having it that easy. That's yeah. the dream. Personally, I would also really like to. So we have been looking a little bit at, especially you, about how people actually play multiplayer, and finding out that you know you have these competitive MP communities. You have the Dev Clash, which everyone loves, but the competitive MP is actually a tiny, tiny, tiny element yeah. of our multiplayer, and most of it is a sort of co-op with a few players. Okay. And I've I think we definitely could try and do more with co-op multiplayer, more ways to play that in the future titles, future expansions, whatever. Or possibly in the expand on the ability to play multiple people in the same country. Because I do think that sort of also focusing where people really are. Yeah, yeah I absolutely um, agree. Yeah. I think so. cooperative multiplayer is a huge, huge area that we should improve. And you know, I know that CK2, for example, lends itself pretty well to cooperative, but not at all for competitive, for example. Um, and I, you know, imagine a cooperative session with maybe sort of a game master AI uh, for the whole team playing CK together. I think that would be a pretty cool thing. Okay, I'm, I'm going to round it off. We could talk about multiple a long time. I have a bunch of ideas. Uh, yeah. I hope Daniel is here to kind of distribute a microphone. We have a couple of minutes for f some f few questions. Yeah. I just got a super quick one, Thanks, Thanks, before we move on. <laughs> uh, I got my talk at 2, and I'm going to kind of deep dive into the multiplayer stuff and show graphs and, and compare stuff. So if you're more interested in that, you should definitely check that out. Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel is here with the microphone for a couple of questions we can do about like two or three, mm -hmm. depending on the length of the answers. Yeah. Uh, hello. As much as I would want to ask each and every one of you a specific question, uh, first I just want to thank Chris and uh, Henrik for working on Victoria 3 right now. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them. Both uh, of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what was your guys' first uh, strategy or, and or grand strategy game that you uh, really got into the genre with? Oh my god, I think it was a game called Operation Market Garden on the Spectrum. <laughs> Maybe not a grand strategy game, it was more of a war game. But I didn't really know anything about games like that and hex-based games or anything. I was just a little kid. Uh, but it really hooked me, and that's how I got into strategy gaming. Civ 1 on a really old Macintosh that could barely play it. Uh, for me, it was a game called Cyber Empires on the Amiga. Uh, so it was, was turn-based strategy uh, with like you built these mechas that you then directly control in real time in battles against other empires. It's pretty cool. Uh, being the baby of the group, I have to say a dungeon keeper. Finally had a PC that could uh, run video games, and uh, that was the first dive in. A bit more managey, but still scratched the itch. Yeah, for computer-wise, it'd probably be Civ 1, but uh, board game, it was Third Reich, okay. which was a bit old school. I know. There was a computer game version of that as well. Yeah. Oh, right. Oh. Also, Never no, is out on the NES. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Hi. Do you think self-taught AI will have a place in future Paradox titles? If so, which areas of game development do you think will be most affected? We already have this in uh, EU4. Type in self-learning AI into the console. Uh, we kind of keep it <laughs> hidden. But, uh, Does it just mock you when you do that? Um, no. I, I, I have a serious answer to this one. I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a pipe dream to have a self-learning AI. Uh, but I think there are, are stuff we could be using it for. Um, you can't just have an AI go like, learn the game. I tried to make an AI that learned Tetris. It, I had it running for like three days, and all it could figure out was like, let's not put all the blocks on top of each other. Uh, so you kind of need to help things out. But you, what you can do is you can use it for certain things, like figure out what, what is a good ship model, for example, to, to use in Stellaris. It can kind of track data on how the player is using it, and statistics, and adjust its weights, and things like that. So it's sort of learning, but, but it's not like learning everything. Right? Yeah, I was about to say more or less the same thing, that the best use for self-learning AI in our games is probably to sort of understand what the player is doing, to use it in things like diplomacy to understand, OK, every time the player decides an alliance, they then break it and attack. So. No, I should not trust them. Yeah, exactly. But to use it for the entire AI is, uh, it's, at this point, it's basically science fiction. It is, uh, because our games, in terms of order of complexity, it's just, orders of magnitude of complexity is just, yeah. you know, you have chess to go, and 
imagine that's like from here back to Stockholm, and then you have go to a PDS game, and that's essentially Stockholm to the moon. Okay, one more question, and don't fret. I know you have tons and tons of questions. These gentlemen love to have a discussion with you guys and answer every single question you have about Victoria 3 and 4, which are apparently in production. And center. 6. So, final question over here, please. Hi. Uh, earlier, a concept of a Cold War game was broached. How would you tackle such a game while avoiding hot-button political issues? Much like Hoi 4 avoids the Holocaust, I'm sure there's plenty of concepts you'd have to avoid in a Cold War game. How would you go about creating a game that could accurately reflect the Cold War but still avoid certain political topics that might be best avoided. That's, that's a super tough one. <laughs> yeah, well, I've already know. said I just wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the reason why you're not getting a yeah. Cold War game, because yeah. that, I think that, that, that question could, is very hard to answer. That could have its own talk in yeah. itself, yeah. dealing with yeah. real-world politics when making historical grand strategy games. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we could never answer that on a panel well, in a reasonable way. But maybe that's what will show up someday. I okay. think a simple answer is that we, we want to entertain people, right? So we tend to probably sidestep this if we can. Yeah. Right. Well, things are just not very entertaining. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, everyone, thank you so much for sitting here and listening. We'll be available after.